Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Joel von Eninum, and he's going to discuss the history of white sturgeon aquaculture, the reproductive biology of the species, and hatchery techniques for wild stock enhancement and commercial aquaculture. Joel is a research associate in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from Michigan State University in 1977, joined the Peace Corps, spent about four years with the Peace Corps as an agricultural extension agent in Thailand, and then he came back to the US, worked for a short time at uh, Fish Breeders of California, which is a catfish farm in the Imperial Valley, before he then got a master's degree in international agricultural development, specializing in reproductive physiology and aquaculture at UC Davis. And his projects have focused on techniques for monitoring the reproductive conditions of wild and domestic sturgeon, sturgeon aquaculture development, broodstock management, spawning induction, and husbandry methods so he knows everything about sturgeon, and particularly white sturgeon, and he will tell you that California is the largest producer of white sturgeon caviar in the world. Coming in second is Italy, but we're number one. Please join me in welcoming Joel Baninaman. Thank you, Jerry, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight, or if you're streaming online. I'm going to begin my presentation with a very brief and general overview of sturgeon and then focus on the white sturgeon aquaculture development and all the various challenges that we had to resolve over the years. So sturgeon as a taxonomic family are very old. They're often called prehistoric fish or living fossils and their ancestry dates back about 200 million years, or the age of the dinosaurs. In comparison, the salmon family is only about 20 million years old. So here's one of our nice white sturgeons. And you can see they have the four barbels, like a catfish, sensory organs to help detect food along the bottom. They also have these electroreceptors around the barbels and mouth area. It's called, they're called ampullae of Lorenzini. Again, the electroreceptors that help detect live prey. They use a feeding technique called benthic cruising, just along, going along the bottom of the delta, estuary, the river. And they have the ventral mouth that drops down like a vacuum cleaner. And they're very opportunistic. They'll eat clams and crabs, shrimps, worms, a fish that swims by, you name it, they'll eat it. They don't have any teeth, but they have a very muscular stomach, which they need to help grind up those shells from the clams and the shrimps and crabs. They don't have scales, but they have these five bony uh, plates called scoots, and they become really sharp in the wild fish. I mean, we've had problems where they would tear up our waders, our nets. They're razor sharp in some cases. And it's probably the main reason why they have so few predators once these scoots are fully developed. They have the shark-like tail called a heterocircle tail. The top portion's longer than the lower portion. And they are classified as vertebrates, but they do not have vertebrae. They actually have a cartilaginous spinal cord, and it's called a notochord. So there's 27 species of sturgeon worldwide, and we have eight in the United States. We've got the Atlantic and short nose along the East Coast, and there's a subspecies of the Atlantic called the Gulf sturgeon down the Gulf area. The lake sturgeon in the Midwest, some of you may have heard about the famous Lake Winnebago. That's where they go during the winter time and drill a big hole in the ice and go spear fishing for lake sturgeon. A very well-maintained population. And it's, a, it's a big sport fishery for the, for the folks during the winter. The Missouri-Mississippi drainage, we've got the shovel-nosed, pallid, and Alabama sturgeons. And for us along the west coast, we have the more abundant white sturgeon and the less abundant green sturgeon. 
So, a little bit about the history. Before and to about 1860, we call these the good times, there was a lot of sturgeon around. They were widely distributed, and they were just primarily a subsistence fishery for the Native Americans. The early colonists actually did not like sturgeon. They actually considered them a nuisance because they would get in their salmon nets and with their sharp scoots, tear them up. So Longfellow, in 1855, wrote this. On the white sand of the bottom lay the monster, Mishinama. Take my bait, O sturgeon, Nama. Come up from below the water. Let us see which is the stronger. Now, I don't know. Oop. This guy, in <laughs> hand fishing with a little, I think maybe he's fishing for the shovel nose or pallid, which are much smaller species. Because, yeah, if you were going to fish for an Atlantic or a white sturgeon, this is more typical of what you see. Uh, it's a bit of a struggle to get these big fish into your boats. So the hunt for the caviar occurred during about a 50-year period, 1860 to 1910. And that's where we severely depleted the sturgeons. And along the Atlantic coast, the Atlantic sturgeon was so plentiful, it was nicknamed Albany beef. And the Europeans are the ones that really wanted the caviar. And so the caviar that was produced in America was primarily being shipped over to Europe. So John Ryder was a, a famous fish culturist back in 1890. And he commented about the Delaware caviar fishery that a single caviar packer shipped 50 tons of caviar to Europe during just one year, 1888. And I like finding all these historical black old photos from back then. I mean, it's hard to imagine collecting eggs for caviar in the dirt next to the river, but back then, that's how they did it. So this is the typical graph you would see regarding sturgeon harvest across the US and around the world. What's happened is there is, uh, this is for the Cal Columbia River white sturgeon. And you can see that there was this peak harvest, over 5 million pounds in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then this crash, and now just this low level population. And this, you can pick almost any sturgeon species, this is what's happened. And the bottom line was that females need to be 15 to 20 years, 25 years old to reproduce for the first time. So the bottom line is we, the harvest depleted the sturgeon faster than they could be reproducing. What was interesting, I found that the Russians had established these fishing rules before this crash even happened. And these are the rules that we try to follow to protect our threatened and endangered species today. To preserve in the spawning grounds all those natural conditions which make them favored by the fish for spawning, to be sufficient to let sufficient quantities of fish reach spawning sites, and young fish should be allowed to reach sexual maturity to permit perpetuation of the species. And John Ryder noted again back in 1890 that the only means of maintaining the sturgeon fishery is through the artificial propagation of the fish. So even back then, what little he knew about this fish, he realized we were overfishing them, we needed to do something about this. So in North America, the caviar fishery peaked in a 10-year period, 1885 and 95, and it was primarily focused on Atlantic sturgeon, lake sturgeon, and white sturgeons. And this old postcard's from 1899, the Columbia River, uh, white sturgeon fishery. And again, from that graph, it was in 1892 was that peak harvest of 5.5 million pounds. And just seven years later, down to 75,000 pounds. So white sturgeon, they're considered the largest freshwater fish in North America, historically, reaching up to 15, 1,600 pounds. And their range is, is from as far south as Ensenada, Mexico, and as far north as Cook Inlet, Alaska. And they're considered semi-anadromous, 
They do go into the freshwater rivers to spawn, and once large enough, have the ability to go out to the ocean and cruise up and down the west coast, but they tend to stay into the bay delta estuaries where there's abundant food sources for them. And again, remember the slow growing issue, especially when you consider aquaculture. It was taking females 15 to 20 years to reach maturity. So the California white sturgeon, that fishery was not as big as the Columbia River fishery. It peaked in 1887 at 660,000 pounds. And then just four years later, it was down to 200,000 pounds. And that was the year, 1901, is when the state closed the commercial and sport fishery. And then they actually had a few short reopenings to assess whether the population was coming back, but they decided it wasn't. And so the state permanently closed these fisheries in 1917. So about 37 years later, in 54, the sport fishery reopened. And it was a bag limit of one fish per day and a minimum size of three feet, four inches. And the primary method was snagging, which was actually very effective. And so it was promptly banned in 56. And then it took a few years for the anglers to figure out you can catch sturgeon with bait. And shrimp, even today, the ghost shrimp, and the grass shrimp are the main baits for white sturgeon fishing in the Bay Delta, along with herring roe, salmon roe, and eel. Those are also good baits. So the sturgeon numbers, even with that sport fishery, they, they more or less stabilized, according to the state, during the early and mid-70s. But then after that, it started dropping again. So they established even stricter limits, a slot size, and they really decided we need to start a research program. There was really nothing much known about the life history of white sturgeon back then. And just a footnote today, for our white sturgeon sport fishery, which still exists in our Bay Delta estuary and in the rivers, the annual bag limit, it's now down to just three fish per year. And they have to be between 40 inches and 60, a slot size. So we're protecting the very large spawning adults and the younger up-and-coming year classes. So the bottom line is we're setting up a more of a catch and release fishery and if you get lucky you catch one in the slot and you get to keep it. So in the late 70s at the same time Fish and Game was looking for research projects, uh, Sergei Dorshoff, one of the Soviet Union's leading authorities on aquaculture, was working with FAO in Cuba with his family and he decided instead of returning to Russia, he went to the US Embassy to seek asylum, and he ended up coming, back, coming to Davis later that year in 1977. And I took a, picture, took a picture of this book. It's in Russian, and it's about aquaculture of sturgeon, written in the very early 80s by a handful of Russian scientists. And it was a tremendous resource for us in our initial projects. And you can see Sergey would go through and translate it for us in bits and pieces, and it's a well-worn volume that, again, helped us tremendously. So our project with research began in 1979 with a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grant. And in 1980, with collaborations with California Department of Fish and Game, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we hired a number of sport fishermen to help us catch the fish, and they were allowed to use the snagging technique so we could get the numbers that we needed. And 80 was the first year that wild fish were caught and the first year that they were successfully spawned at, up at UC Davis. So each captured fish um, was placed into a smaller boat with a transport tank and then that fish was moved to our larger vessel for research. And we would have to check for sex and stage of maturity for each individual. We only wanted to take the mature males and females up to UC Davis for spawning. And there's no external characteristics to do this easily, so we make a small incision through the abdominal wall. And the males are quite easy because you see the very large white testes and you know it's a mature male. Female you will see the black eggs and we will collect a small sample to analyze these eggs 
for their stage of maturity up at the laboratory. And here's Sergey initiating the, the first sampling of our sturgeon back in 1980. So these fish were actually placed in a tank at Tiburon, a big tomato tank. And they had a source of fresh water because we needed to acclimate them to fresh water before we could move them to UC Davis because, of course, we didn't have salt water systems up there. And remember, sturgeon do spawn in fresh water. So we would acclimate them and then transport them up to UC Davis in a transport tank up at UC Davis. An even larger tomato tank was kept for the sturgeon. And you can see we kept it well stocked with rainbow trout. And these would slowly disappear, especially at nighttime. So staging final maturity in females has been a real challenge. We take that egg sample collected, and we boil and chill the eggs, like a hard-boiled chicken egg, and then section that egg with a razor blade and forceps underneath a dissecting scope. And you get these nice two halves of an egg. And we need to see the position of the nucleus. What happens when the females go through final maturity, which lasts three, four months, is the nucleus is in the center and migrates slowly up to the top of the animal pole, and that's when they're ready to spawn. So if a female is in this stage one, two, we know she still has to be rechecked in three, four, five weeks. She's quite a ways away. Female at the stage five is the one that's ready to be spawned in the next week or two. So spawning up at UC Davis, they were induced to spawn. We developed a number of uh, specialized equipment for handling large sturgeon. Um, this is our tube net, where you allow the fish to swim in one of the open sides. You claw, close off the two sides and get a third person in the middle to help move around these large fish. Uh, the stretchers are very important to handle the big fish. And the sturgeon exhibit, similar to sharks, what we call tonic immobility. You roll them over there onto their backs, their belly side up, and they lay quite calmly. But during our, any surgical procedure to collect eggs or collect ovulate eggs during spawning, we do add low-level anesthesia into the mouth across the gills. And there's a recirculating ice chest below, and it just kind of goes in a loop. And then as we're getting close to being done with the surgery, we shift to fresh water to start the recovery. And Sergey here is actually collecting some ovulated eggs from one of our very first uh, wild fish that was spawned at UC Davis. So in 81, the industry started wanting to get involved. They saw the potential for this fish for aquaculture. So we established an informal collaboration with Fish and Game and UC Davis and the number of fish farms. And we wanted to do research leading toward commercial development. And resource enhancement was being looked at by Fish and Game because they were concerned about the population. So 81 was the first year that permits were granted to some aquaculture farms to collect some wild broodstock. And it was their first year of successful spawning. And in their case, most of their fish were actually caught upriver on the Sacramento at night by uh, fishermen using hook and line. And they were uh, basically permitted through fish and game to be able to catch some wild fish for the fish farms. So 82 to 84, the main projects were establishing reliable artificial propagation techniques. And a number of farms, 12 farms, had permits uh, to get some wild fish from the river to start their, uh, your classes of fish, while they developed intensive culture grow-out systems on their farms. And today, today the sterling caviar and the fishery are the two largest sturgeon farms in California. So artificial propagation techniques. We have to induce the fish to spawn, of course. We take them away from their river environment where they naturally spawn. And so we had to figure out which hormones, what dose rates would work the best. CCP is called common carp pituitary. It's considered the universal donor. I actually use it a lot when I was in Thailand. It works very well. You can spawn many different species of fish with it. What it basically does is it tells the ovary to 
ovulate, release, my, release the eggs. And so the issue is with pituitary glands is that you can get eggs released from an ovary that really isn't in the perfect final maturation stage. So you can get low quality eggs. Eggs that will not have high fertility and they'll have very low hatch. And so we learned after doing some research to shift to what we call GnRHA, gonadotropin releasing hormone analog. And that basically acts on the fish's own pituitary brain gonadal axis to produce a more natural cascade of hormones. So the ovulation is much more natural. It basically is following their own hormonal system. So that what happens is if you use GnRHA on a female that is not at that perfect stage of maturity, she basically will just not ovulate. You will not get those poor quality eggs. And you can see we do, we do the injections underwater. You can do them in the tanks while they swim by to minimize the handling stress. So hatchery protocols had to be developed for egg and milk collection. And collection of milk from the males ended up being pretty easy because they produce a lot of milk. And we just use a section of aquarium airline tubing connected to a large syringe. And we'll store the milt in various containers on wet ice, keep it chilled until it's needed to fertilize the eggs. Now, collecting ovulated eggs, another major challenge with sturgeon. You cannot simply strip the eggs like a salmon or trout. They have specialized ducts called malarian ducts. And these regulate the release of eggs out the vent because in the river, when the sturgeon spawns, they spawn over 18 to 24 hours, releasing these small batches of eggs over the very large areas of cobble and rock. And so to bypass those ducts, what we established was a cesarean surgery. So we make about a eight to 10 centimeter incision collect the majority of the eggs in about 15 minutes. You know, we, probably, we estimate we get maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of the eggs, which is still plenty from a big white sturgeon. And then after collecting the eggs, uh, suture the fish up just like any other animal surgery, a series of internal sutures, series of external sutures. I'm still not good at this, am I? Um, external sutures some antibiotic injection, and they heal very well. In fact, here's a female, one of our captive females that was spawned, you can see the scar from four years ago, and this one was from two years ago. And uh, some of the farms have some of their really prime brood stock that have been spawned, I think, up to eight times now. They're from, I think, 1990 year class. Some of them are almost 200 pounds. That's one advantage of the white sturgeon, too, as an aquaculture species, is they, they handle very well our surgical techniques. Um, to try to do this to a striped bass would be very difficult. So egg fertilization was also a bit of a challenge because the sturgeon eggs have more than one micropile, which is the opening that allows the sperm to enter. They actually have six to eight of these, six, eight, 12 of these openings at the animal pole. So if the sperm is too concentrated, you can get more than one in at a time. It's called polyspermy. And that creates too much DNA, uneven chromosome matching, and you basically get deformed embryos that won't hatch. And so we worked out is we need to dilute the milt. So we dilute it one to 200 to get the right concentration, and then fertilize the eggs that we collected from the cesarean surgery in our stainless steel bowls. Now the eggs are fertilized probably within the first 30, 40 seconds based on our work, but we will fertilize the eggs for two minutes uh, to make sure a large bowl of eggs gets access to the swimming sperm that's been activated by the water. But after two minutes, the white sturgeon and all sturgeon eggs, they become sticky. Because again, in the rivers where they spawn naturally, these small batches of eggs sink to the bottom the rocks and cobble and they stick until they hatch. And of course, we don't want these eggs sticking to our bowl or to each other into large clumps because they'll just suffocate, get fungus, and they'll die. And so what we worked out 
is that we add a suspension of silt water. We use, uh, some people have used pottery clay, bentonite, fuller's earth, some type of really fine silt that basically coats the individual eggs with that silt so that they're individual eggs while they're forming that jelly coat. It just keeps coating the egg and you have nice individual eggs. And we have to do this for like one hour. That's pretty much the protocol. Some people have tried to, oh, 40 minutes, looks good. You put them in your jars and they start clumping. So it's a minimum of one hour. Small batches of eggs, you can use a, a feather or large, large bowls. We'll get students one hand in each bowl. Sometimes we spawn two, three fish at once. We have eight, nine bowls going, so we get a lot of grad students to help out. Um, and gently stir these eggs for, for that one hour. And after that, rinse them clean and place them in what we call McDonald jars. These are specialized jars where the water comes down a center tube and then up wells along the sides, keeping the eggs gently flowing. They get lots of good oxygenated water. And they stay in these jars until they hatch, which takes seven to eight days at the optimal temperature. See one of the developing eggs turning into a little larvae. And once, once they hatch, they swim up with the water flow and out these jars into one of our larval tanks. And this is what these guys look like, primarily just a giant yolk sac. And that yolk is their nutrition for the next 9, 10, 11 days. After the yolk is used, we need to start feeding them food. And we use these automatic belt feeders. Basically, they offer feed slowly on a belt for over a 24-hour period, so we fill it every morning. But initially, this was a bit of a challenge with the larvae of sturgeon. We were using a trout diet, so what we had available. There's no sturgeon diets, of course. And what we found out was those little, that trout diet was a dry diet, and it was like a little rock for those poor guys' sensitive little mouth, and they would not eat it. And so, yeah, we had a bit of a few failures going on, but we figured out that the semi-moist diets that are available, they have a higher moisture content, so they're much softer. And that was the key to our success with feeding sturgeon larvae. You have to use a soft, moist diet. And over the year, years and some of the farms, I've had a few issues where somebody calls me and said, what happened to my larvae? They all died. And I go, let me see your diet. You got the soft moist, right? Yeah, yeah here it is. And no, no, this is the dry diet. And no, he lost all his larvae. So 82 and 84 continued to improve our techniques. And the farms continued to develop intensive culture grow out systems. 8084, we were actually, we were mitigating for removing uh, broodstock from the river, taking them out of the spawning population. We were allowed to release larvae and juveniles back, and it was quite the meaty event back in those years to release fish. And the broodstock that we used, um, we would always release them as part of the fishing game agreement to release them back in the river after using them for spawning. So 1985-86, those are some big years. It was the first sales of white sturgeon as a food fish. And that was also the first year that our domestic males that have been raised in captivity from those little eggs at age four were maturing and producing milk. And so we could use them with our wild caught females each spring so we could stop taking males. We only had to focus on females after 85-86. And sturgeon meat, if you haven't had a chance, you really need to try it. It's, the fresh fillets are really good. I just checked, and they're running $12 to $15 a pound. The smoked product, cold or hot, but I think the hot smoked product is the better. Uh, if you like smoked salmon, uh, smoked sturgeon is outstanding. Uh, again, online, I just saw it ranges from $30 to $80 a, $80 a pound. These value-added products are becoming, they're going to be more popular with our industry. They are starting to make more of the smoked product. Now, one, th one unique characteristic of the sturgeon meat, 
it's got a tough texture and you really need to age it. Not as long as beef, but we actually had some researchers back in 92 at UC Davis in the Department of Food Science Technology study that tough texture problem observed in farm sturgeon. And it could be minimized by allowing the sturgeon meat to go through rigor prior to cooking. Now you may be able to sneak, if you eat a fresh, fresh sturgeon before the rigor sets in, it's actually a lot less than that, eight hours. I mean, it happens really quick. The meat is very tough. The muscle fibers just really tense up on a sturgeon fillet. So it gives it that really tough texture. And so you really need to allow several days for the muscle fibers to relax and you have the more tender flesh. But of course, you know, that's been very difficult to explain to chefs, you know, this nice sturgeon filet, just let it set in the refrigerator for three days. Because we've all been taught, the rule of thumb, the fresher the fish, the better. But actually, no, we need to actually age the sturgeon. But the seafood, our sturgeon processors basically will age their product before they ship it to their customers. Um, but the fishermen, the fishermen do realize, they've learned, I've talked to a number of them, and they say, yeah, yeah, you definitely have to let it set in the fridge for a few days, and it's more tender. And if you get the chance, marinate it in a teriyaki marinade for eight hours and put it on the grill, fantastic. So 87 is when we formally established the Sturgeon Broodstock Development Program. And it's still ongoing. I run that program with the industry. Help out new farms and teach them all these techniques I'm reviewing. So it's with the industry, California Fish and Wildlife it's now called. Um, and UC Davis. And back then in 87, the goal was development of our domestic females. We know the males matured at age four, but how long would we have to wait for the females to mature? And at the various farms and at UC Davis, we were checking the female broodstock every fall to determine, you know, how are they developing? Do we finally start seeing some small white eggs, which means they're starting to deposit yolk, and once we see that, we know it takes two years before they have the black eggs. We actually had a PhD student that, after six years, he said, I have to leave. And of course, the year he left is when we finally started seeing little white eggs. <laughs> uh, 88, that was a big year for the, the hatchery manual for white sturgeon that we published from UC Davis. It summarized the last seven years of work and actually to this date, it's still the, only, the main thing out there and it's considered the Bible at a lot of sturgeon hatcheries around North America. And here it is, 1990, the big red letter year. We finally had first spawning of domestic female broodstock. So how old were they? Eight years old. Now in comparison, I have some wild white sturgeon data from Columbia River and they average 24 years old. And you can see what the issue is, body weight. So raising our sturgeon at the warmer grow out temperature, feeding them a diet, a good diet every day, they basically grew faster than their wild counterparts. And they reached that minimum body size to, to reach first puberty. And they had a similar total number of eggs, fecundity, and relative fecundity is number of eggs per kilogram of body weight. So taking this into account, they basically had identical amount of eggs. So one of the issues of sturgeon, you cannot sex them by any external characteristics. You can't tell male from female, especially when the industry was starting to sell the meat fish at age three, when they're about 15 pounds. How do you tell male from female? So what we did, was developing a technique whereby we made this, this is to illustrate what we're looking at. They actually make the incision about one third this size. But what we look for making that incision through the abdominal wall is for the nice white turgid testes, and this is fatty adipose tissue, or the grainy ovigerous folds of the female. And if you have a good eye or a magnifying glass, you can actually see tiny translucent spheres of the developing eggs. And that's how we sex the fish back then. And a good crew on the farms, they can go, to, go through 600, 800 fish a day. But today, 
we actually use portable ultrasound units and we view the sonograms to see whether it's male or female. Now these machines are expensive. This one is a really nice one. It's about $30,000, but it's got a really good bright screen for working outside, has high resolution, so it works really well. And you can actually do six, 800 fish in three, four hours. It's very fast. And of course, there's no incision. It's the least invasive. So here you go. Here's what our sonograms look like. So this, the orient to you, is the muscle. And you can see the nice myomeres of the muscle. And below the muscle, here's the testes. And the key aspect to the testes is this real bright white border of the testicular membrane. And in general, it's a more homogeneous white dark. While the female, again, here's the muscle and the nice myomeres right below the muscle, these grainy ovigerous folds, and it has a very rough, uneven edge. That's how you can tell it's a nice female. It does not have that distinct white border. This is with this new Sonosite machine, which these are fantastic photos. I should have gotten some of the ones from my old machine where it looks like an old black and white TV. And you can't tell anything. <laughs> it's very difficult. But with these newer units, it's amazing. So this is a big year, 83, Detloff. She and her colleagues had her, their book translated to English. And here it is, Sturgeon Fishes, Development of Biology and Aquaculture. It's a tremendous book. These, the Russians were way ahead of their time. They have a series of developmental stages of the eggs through embryo and through the hatch that are those old, I don't know if you remember, in the old days, at least for me, you had to do the black and white stipple of, you know, in your science classes, they have photo, they did that stippling of the developments that are just beautiful in this book. And you can see it's very well used volume in my lab. So 1984, that was the year of our first farmed caviar. And that was the year we were independent from wild brood stock. Our females were age eight and starting to mature in captivity. And that was the agreement with the Department of Fish and Game is that we would not produce any caviar until we were stopping taking wild fish. And so the first farm caviar was produced in 94. And you remember that photo, the old historical photo of pulling those eggs on the riverbank in the dirt? You can see it's a little more <laughs> rigorous and you have to have a really clean environment to do this in, to have a high quality product. 95, 2000, just did a lot of work with larval and juvenile feed and feed rates. That took a lot of our time. And, and the other thing we found was we had to verify the final maturity. A number of issues on some of the farms. Remember I talked about that stage five nucleus and you should be able to spawn it, but we were finding females like that and we injected them and they did not spawn. And so we decided to follow up with a more rigorous test and we would place some of those eggs in a saline media with progesterone, a hormone that makes the nucleus respond if the egg is receptive. And we found 16 hours and 16 Celsius incubator would do the job. It took a while to figure this all out. But, and then we boiled and bisected them like before. And what we want to see is this, what we call GVBD or germinal vesicle breakdown. If you have a batch of eggs and all of them break down in our assay, that female, literally 100% of the time, will ovulate when you inject them. Um, it shows that the eggs are receptive, they're ready to go. The females that were not responding, even though they appeared to be in the right stage with the nucleus at the top, you know, we associated that with, you know, maybe they, they were stressed out, they were moved from one facility to another, and what can happen is that their hormonal system can shut down before the eggs start to break down, so it can be a weak uh, actually up to three week lag where they just will not respond. And actually we tested this assay. So we had a few females that did not have germinal vesicle breakdown. They looked like this after the incubation and we injected them anyway and they did not ovulate. So this was a reliable assay that has been used. So here's our production of caviar in 2001 was our first overseas sales. And it's been a gradual growth over the years. And actually, 
at this time, we're still at this level of production, about 12,000 kilos. And it's from two major farms in California and one smaller farm. So the general management scheme um, for the sturgeon, there is a big water requirement challenge. Uh, for spawning, for the incubation of the eggs, you need a cooler water, 12, 13 Celsius, about 55 Fahrenheit. But then once they've hatched, you can move the fish into a warmer grow out temperature. And this has been determined to be optimal for the fastest and best growth um, for white sturgeon. And then once they get three years old, 15 pounds, we use the ultrasound, excess females, males are sold for meat. Females kept for caviar or broodstock. And don't forget, you always got to keep some males for broodstock. And then we continue to grow them out for seven, until they're seven, eight, nine years old when they first produce eggs. But when they get to this point, you need to move them back into that cold water. Caviar females and broodstock females during the winter and spring need a cooler water. It's called vernalization. And then a gradual increase, and then they spawn perfectly. If you kept these females in that constant grow out warmer water, during the spring they start reabsorbing their eggs. You check them, the eggs are turning to mush. Um, occasionally they do this anyway. Um, every two years, two years later that female will have eggs again. Basically they're on a two year cycle within captivity. On the wild, it's three to five years. So caviar processing. So in the fall winter, the females are identified by making that small abdominal incision. Um, to see if they have black eggs. We can use the ultrasound. We're going to probably move to that, but actually the farms like to actually check the eggs because you can feel that little, you know, those two dozen eggs you collect, you feel them. Sometimes they even taste them. Um, but they're looking for to make sure they're nice and firm because some of those eggs, if they're too soft, they won't make good caviar. So you don't want to, you know, kill a female and start processing it to find it has too soft of eggs. So we check individual females place them in lift nets, put them into a big transport uh, tank on a transport truck and move them to those cool water tanks or the cool water systems. And then once the caviar season is upon you and you decide to start, they're moved to the processing plant, individual females are euthanized, uh, abdomens opened up and the paired ovaries are removed. And this is all done by hand, individual female, one female at a time very labor intensive. And again, you can see everything's got to be done under very clean conditions. So the ovary is then cut into smaller pieces, and then it's gently rubbed over a stainless steel mesh so that the eggs fall through into a bowl. Then they need to be rinsed and cleaned uh, to remove any broken eggs, any yolk, any little pieces of ovarian tissue or fatty tissue. Um, after several rinsing, you end up with a nice, clean product. You allow the excess water to drain. You, you, you uh, weigh the total egg mass that you collected, the total amount of caviar. It's not caviar, yet, it's flakes. Then you would calculate how much, uh, much salt to add to the eggs. It's the only thing that we add. Three to four percent of the total weight, we will add salt. And then these eggs are thoroughly mixed together. And then a key step is here, actually. The egg salt, the salted eggs are laid out on this fine mesh stainless steel, and you allow the excess water to drain because, of course, the salt pulls out a little bit of water. And this is a real key step, apparently, where you don't want the eggs too dry or you don't want them too wet when you place them in the individual tins. And you ask, well, how much caviar do you get? It's about 8 to 10 percent of the body weight of the female is caviar. So what does that mean? 180 pound female, eight pounds of caviar, 128 ounces. Retail on the internet, 90 to $600 an ounce. So one female, 12,000 to $77,000 in value. Again, that's retail. Farmers are getting five to 10,000 a female, which is still, that's a pretty good quantity. Uh, it's definitely profitable. And that wide range in the price for caviar depends on the size, the texture, the flavor, and color. And this golden caviar, caviar that has very low 
black melanin pigment. Uh, that's very rare, and it gets the highest price. Well, this is the more common caviar that gets the lower price. It's the typical very dark jet black, I call it, caviar. But you can see there's a wide range of colors, and they get different rankings. So long story short, the white sturgeon species is a really good species because they utilize the entire water column in a tank so we can intensively culture them. And they grow relatively fast at that 18, 19, 20 Celsius, reaching 15 pounds in about three years. And that is the primary market size. They make a bullet, which is basically heads and fins off and gutted. And that bullet is shipped around to various seafood processors. And it has that great quality meat and caviar. But again, it's challenging, the sexing, staging females, spawning, and those two water temperatures needed. That's why there's, and people say, why aren't there more sturgeon farms? Um, these are a lot of the reasons why. Caviar, so 14 years after the first wild caught female was spawned, we produced our first caviar. And after 20 years, we produced the most farmed caviar in the USA and internationally the most white sturgeon caviar. And again, this was from numerous collaborations with state and federal agencies, scores of different research grants, and the aquaculture farms, and most importantly, the UC Davis numerous faculty, staff, and lots of graduate students, and especially Sergei Dorshoff, who is considered by the industry the father of sturgeon aquaculture because he spearheaded and led all this research since 1979. Now, if you're interested in more reads on sturgeon and caviar, you just Google sturgeon caviar books. So Richard Carey wrote The Philosopher Fish, Sturgeon, Caviar, and the Geography of Desire. And actually, there's a really nice chapter in there about the UC Davis program. He did a really good job. And then there's another book by Ingra Saffron called Caviar, The Strange History and Uncertain Future of the World's Most Coveted Delicacy. And it is, caviar is labeled in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most expensive food item. In Iran, there's a caviar that sells for $1,000 an ounce. And yeah, I want, in closing, remember that the Longfellow, 1855, calling the sturgeon the monster Mishinama? Well, here's some Canadians, 2005, saying, look at this monster, eh? It's a mate up on the Fraser River. They still catch these 1,000-pound white sturgeon up there. And it's a catch and release fishery only. Um, but they, there's a number of these large monsters that these guys catch. I think, I think these guys said it took them like eight hours and six or eight six packs of beer. But it was a long struggle, apparently. But a nice catch. And I think we have plenty of time for questions.